Hello, um, I'm Ken, um, and I'm a software engineer at Google. I'm one of the founding members of Apache Beam PMC, um, and just because some people talk about how much they're working on this stuff, this is my 95% job, um, which is awesome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Beam, uh, a little bit about state, and a little bit about portability. Now, when I say state, um, by the end of this talk, you should know what I mean. It's a very specific kind of state um, that doesn't necessarily encompass everything that is referred to as state at this conference. Um, and you should know what it looks like in Beam um, and why you might want to use it via Beam. So uh, quick agenda, there are four parts. First, I'm going to give a super quick intro to Beam, um, just a tiny bit. Um, and then I'll talk about how state and then timers fit into it. Stateful processing and Beam generally refers to both of these together. And then I'll give a tiny demo of sorts. So um, what is Apache Beam? Well, the sort of TLDR of it is computations like this. Um, if what you do on a day-to-day -day looks like that, um, then Beam is an abstraction for that kind of computation. This is how Flink draws them. Um, I think it has to do with screen real estate. But I guess I'm wondering how many people here are like using Flink in production, actually? OK. That's just getting a sense of like how have you used this in anger? What kind of thoughts are you having about this kind of computation, these DAG-based computations? So to give a sense, um, where Beam comes from um, relative to other DAG-based computational platforms. This is sort of a rough smattering of different uh, data processing engines that you have to choose from that all have computations or you can roll your own that sort of look like my drawing that I had before. And you know, they're not, it's not trying to be a fair list or really historical. It's just that these all share the fact that they do these embarrassingly parallel computations that come from realistically 90s functional programming. So you've got parallel maps, you've got reductions, and then you've got them all chained together. So when Google, this is, came from Google Cloud Dataflow. When Google like open source Cloud Dataflow, we initially at, included a ton of hooks so that anybody could write another backend for it. So um, we got one for Spark and one for Flink, uh, kind of built by people outside of Google, and this was really exciting. Um, and we wanted to have a huge impact by bringing this all together, and that's where we donated the code base to Apache and started Apache Beam. And then um, we got even more ambitious. So this is sort of a diagram of doing a sum per key. I've got little squares trickling in from above. Uh, the color of the squares is what the key is. And so doing the summation, maybe it gathers up all the red squares, adds them together. And so below, you see the, the sum of the red inputs coming out. And what I was sort of describing is that when you have this abstract, Backend independent idea of a graph of computation. You can run it on Flink, Dataflow, Spark, Apex, and we have Gear Pump in uh, a feature branch. And so that's sort of one side of Beam's portability story. And this is um, what we have talked about a lot in terms of the Beam vision. Um, and in this case, these are the runners we actually do have. You can actually do this today. But the other side of the portability story um, is that. You can also write Java code or Python code um, and execute it on any of these engines. So to understand what that means, I'm going to start the picture again um, at sort of a, let's say I want to read from Kafka. Um, I'm using Python. Uh, this is what actual Beam Python code looks like. You say, OK, uh, I'm going to read from Kafka. But what this might actually do is that this Kafka IO uh, connector might be implemented in Java. Um, and so it's actually sort of a, an indirect reference to a Java class, Kafka.io. And then this, from this, you construct a language-independent, backend-independent graph that looks like the squares in the middle. That's, I'm using that as my language-independent, backend-independent graph representation. Um, and then you submit that to these platforms, and by implementing and supporting Beam's portability model, um, this backend is actually going to call back into a containerized Java SDK, and it's going to execute uh, this Kafka IO written in Java, um, even though you've written your pipeline in Python. So 
that's sort of the, the full ambition of Beam is use the language of your choice, run it on the operational situation of your choice, and mix and match connectors between languages. So uh, just to return the vocabulary um, to make sure, uh, well, sorry, to return to this picture to make sure we have the same vocabulary, um, we call this a pipeline in Beam. The squares are these massively parallel computations. We call them p-transforms. And the arrows are the data flowing in between the p-transforms, and we call them p-collections. Um, and you shouldn't um, interpret this as any kind of finite collection. A p-collection could be bounded, which means we know it's finite, or it could be unbounded, which means we actually don't know. It's basically like you would consider a, a data stream. And then, in order to define this language independent, backend independent, I'm getting tired of those words, uh, computation, in the Beam model, you think about four questions. You think about what you're computing, which are these basic MapReduce um, and reading from external data sources. You think about event time, because that's fundamental to uh, the Beam model. You think about where you're in event time your data is located, how you want to group it, like in hourly windows. Um, and then the last two questions are up there. I'm going to fade them out because this talk is really focused on what you're computing and how it relates to where your data is distributed in event time. So when I say what are you computing, it's sort of this is your menu of things that you can do. You can read using parallel connector to an external system. Beam has a really cool primitive to that. And there is a talk on this at five, I believe, um, from Malo about how uh, Beam supports these parallel reads. And then you can do per element computation, where here we call it pardu. You might call it a map, um, or it also encompasses filter and flat map. And then a third type of computation you have is grouping. You have group by key, you have combined per key, and these are the essential operations that really have communication across input elements. And then, because Beam is intended to be a programming model, uh, the last kind of uh, transform that I briefly want to mention is composites. You can build a transform that looks just like one of the primitives so users can use it transparently. Um, so the, the takeaway from these is that none of these are talking about event time windowing, I guess. That's one thing I want to mention. Um, and there's nothing here talking about triggering. I don't know if you've used those in either Beam or Flink. These are all designed to be uh, mostly orthogonal to event time uh, and processing time triggering. And that's going to come up as we start talking about how you'd interact with state. So I'm not actually going to talk about composites, um, because those are just how you build abstractions. I'm not going to talk about parallel reads. Um, and I'm not really going to talk about grouping computations. The state that I mean is when you're doing a per element computation and you need a little bit of mutable state on the side. So this is a part of the Pardew operation in Beam. So here I'm just zooming in a little bit. I've put the Pardew operation in between these two P collections. I've got my input yellow input square being mapped to the yellow circle. And this is how I'd illustrate uh, the state that this uh, Pardew operation might have access to. It's striped in different colors. If you've used keyed state in Flink, it's for the same reason. The state is partitioned into disjoint parts. Um, and that's um, sort of fundamental to parallelism in this case. So it's just every time an element comes through, you have some readable, writable storage. And so the question is, how does this fit into the Beam model? Um, how does this fit into Beam's portability story? Um, and I'm going to keep zooming in. And I'm going to use sort of an example throughout the rest of my talk where I'm going to say, OK, let's say for each key and perhaps some event time windowing, I want to compute some approximate distribution of my data, just some quantiles. So it's going to be stateful because elements are going to be coming through, and I'm going to be storing what my current approximation is. And up here, just to prove that it's real, like I don't want to dig too much into code because this is really sort of a talk about what state is and how it fits in. But I write pardu of a do fun, and I'm going to declare what state I'm going to use, and then I'm going to sort of, in my element processing method, I'm going to update the quantiles, and I'm going to perhaps produce output if it's needed. Maybe I'm outputting every element. Maybe I only want to output when there's something interesting to say. So a little closer to the metal, this is where it 
how things are actually going to be executed, right? We have all these different partitions of state. And in order to make it easy for a user, uh, you don't actually ever deal with any concurrency. You write per key straight line code uh, that interacts with a partition of the state. Um, this is one, one of many reasons that the state needs to be disjoint per key. Now, uh, to mean a little bit more, this is how it actually executes, right? We, for each key, um, because I'm isolated to a key, my processing function, in Beam we call it a do fun. This is very similar to Flink's process fun in a lot of ways. I'm receiving one element at a time, um, and I'm interacting with state somehow, and I'm outputting whatever I feel is appropriate. I think the reason I, I wanted to redraw the picture this way is that you see that in this sense, on each uh, color, everything is linearized and it's not parallel. So in order to achieve parallelism, you need to have sufficiently many partitions. Um, I'm going to skip that one. So, so far, this has probably looked a whole lot like what you already thought stream processing was. Uh, stateful stream processing is receiving all the elements per key in some order and doing some stateful computation on them. Um, but in, in Beam, that's not the case. So the expected result in Beam, since windowing is orthogonal to these sort of the basic definition of what you're computing, if you decide to window your data into, say, fixed windows of an hour, um, your expected result here is that you're going to get an approximate uh, quantile result for each key for each hour, right? Otherwise, you don't actually have a correct approximate quantiles transformation. And likewise, if you want to window into 30-minute windows sliding by 10 minutes, right? You're expecting to get a different correct result for each of these windows regardless of the slide. This sort of shouldn't be the concern of this transform. Um, and the reason I brought sliding windows up, of course, is that it needs, each element needs to contribute separately to the state for each window. So uh, this uh, sort of, now I'm thinking of it as, I don't know why I think it looks like ice cream or something. This storage here, this partition by key, it's actually partitioned by key and window. So if you draw it as a table, each column here uh, is one partition along the, um, Along the left-hand axis, those are sort of those are the names of the pieces of state that you're managing, and then each column uh, is one partition. And so, as long as you have enough columns, you have enough parallelism. Um, and one thing to note is that your event time windowing shows up in these columns, and event time windowing also is how you know when a piece of state is unlikely to be accessed again. And so, as a bonus, you get to automatically collect state as opposed to having manage what state is relevant at this point in event time. So here's our hourly quantiles again, and I want to compare this with another way of doing this computation, which in many stream processors are very similar, um, but are conceptually different. Um, and this will sort of tie into how state is thought of when you think about Flink. So here is another diagram. I've windowed my input into fixed windows of an hour, and on a, say, a per key and window basis, it's being streamed into this time I've written quantiles combiner. When I say combiner, I mean associative commutative operator, the thing that you use when you're doing a reduction. And so each of these is giving one output. So the expected result here is also uh, some approximation of the distribution of your input for each hour. So what is the difference? Um, and I think, and this is important to know if you're going to start using state explicitly in your pipelines. So on the left, I've redrawn the combiner, and on the right, you have this stateful quantile approximating do fun, right? They have the same expected result, because if you naively think about them, um, this is, they're actually essentially the same thing. But they have different properties, and they can and are executed differently. So in a, a realistic data processing engine that maybe has an optimizer attached to it, the commutative, associative, and single output optimization uh, operator, it enables all of these optimizations that are super cool. You can execute it in a variety of topologies, right? All your input can come in, and you can aggregate it first, and then only shuffle the accumulators over the network, and then later on you follow up by recombining the accumulators to get your final output. And you can do this, you know, if you have a hot key, you can split it up, right? You're not limited to key granularity. Um, whereas if you write this stateful per key and window operator, well, 
the data is coming out of order. That's just the nature of data from your data source. So you've got a stable operator that's sort of likely, maybe it's not associative, not commutative, doesn't have to be. Um, and you're going to shuffle all of your elements in order to feed them uh, one at a time to this do fun. So, another, so that's sort of the trade-off in terms of how they're going to be executed. And so the benefit is you can do things that are non-associative and non-commutative. And you also get benefits in that over here, if you're writing something in this straight line code, it's very straightforward to add lots of cool features like side outputs, side inputs. Um, the user is just in control of whether you want to output multiple times uh, when elements come in as opposed to a combiner where sort of by definition there's really one output. Um, and if I, so like ignoring that, so that's the sort of execution plan um, difference. And another big difference is that the, the way that you control when output occurs. If you write a combiner, um, and I'm going to speak from Beam right now because that's what I know better, you can control when this aggregation outputs with triggers. That's one big part of our uh, programming model is you say, okay, um, I'm doing a sum per key, and every 10 seconds the processing continues, I just want a revised output for that summation. Um, and so the output's governed by this trigger, which is totally unaware of your computation, right? We have this little language of triggers. Um, it doesn't know how many elements, well, maybe it knows how many elements you've gotten, but it doesn't know the details of how your quantile's computation's progressing. Um, it doesn't know what the last output was. So it's sort of data and computation unaware. Whereas if you write the stateful do fun, sort of like the sky's the limit. You can remember what the last thing your output was. You can remember what the last thing you stored was. You can say, oh, well, I've sort of, I've done three stores, and so now I want to produce output. Um, and a particular feature request uh, we get a lot in Beam is wanting to output only when something changes. Um, and this is sort of a quintessential way to do that. Another simple example, which I'm, I'm bringing up because it's really easy to understand, um, and I used it in my blog post on this. This is a non-associative, non-commutative, non-deterministic operation where I just take all of the input elements and I just assign them increasing numbers. And if what the downstream transform needs is just a sequence number on every element, this is perfectly fine. You could never, if you wrote this as a combiner, first of all, your combiner would be insane. The accumulator would be really inefficient. Um, and it would be, of course, non-associative, non-commutative. So it doesn't really make sense, but it makes perfect sense as sort of a stateful operator. OK, so that's, that's the gist of how you do state um, on, on its own. I'll get to timers in just a second after we talk about the kinds of state we've got. We've got um, value states, which are just a mutable value. A bag state is a special addition. Um, and again, some of these are in the catalog of Flink's keyed state. And if they are, they're very similar. They're all related or sort of intermingling APIs. Um, but so a bag state supports blind writes. You can just throw elements in it. You don't have to do a read, modify, write. A combining state is specialized so that you throw elements in it and it sort of collapses them into accumulator and the runner backend sort of has a lot of leeway in terms of when it combines accumulators and how it uh, compacts them. And then a set state supports efficient membership checking and map state supports lookups of individual keys and partial writes. And that, by that, I mean just writing a few keys at a time without having to pull in the whole map. So state is cool. It has some use cases. Um, sometimes they may have seemed like a stretch, but they really, really shine when you combine it with timers. So um, just to explain what I mean, I'm going to start again. This is my super generic diagram of a stateful do fund accessing state. And then I'm just also going to let it set timers, get callbacks from timers, right? So what is a timer in this case? Like, how does this relate to the rest of the programming model? Is that if you decide you're going to set a timer, that needs to be obviously kept consistent. Like, when you commit the fact that you've processed these elements, the timer needs to be committed with it. And likewise, the timer, when you handle it, needs to be acknowledged in the same way. So these are, um, you know, they're like real pieces of data. Um, And this is sort of what it looks like in Java really quickly. I've got my timer ID up here. Um, and then I register an on timer callback. And here in my, let's see here, I haven't, when you're processing your elements, maybe you set this timer. And here you have your callback and you can access timers and state. You can read state, set more timers. You can do um, whatever you want to do in that callback. So 
There are two kinds of timers, and I'm going to show a little example of each. Uh, the first one is processing time, and that's sort of as your pipeline's running, you want to call back because 10 seconds have passed and it's time to emit some output. Uh, the other kind of timer, which is really fundamentally different, is an event time timer. And these fire when the watermark passes a certain point. So wait, like the end of the window would be a classic example. So they're really a measure of completeness, like how much of your data does the system think you've got. So here's how you might use uh, a processing time timer. I've got, this is digging inside my little stateful do fund. This is just a, a silly example. I, you know, that's, these get extremely elaborate, so this is just what I could fit on a slide. So I've got all these elements coming in, and maybe I immediately output based on the element that came in. I set a timer that says, call me back in five seconds. Um, and then I'm also gonna buffer some requests I'm gonna make later. And then when the timer goes off in five seconds later, um, I pull out all the requests that have been buffered up, and I actually make that batch RPCs and I output all the elements. So this is sort of a way that you could use processing time, uh, perhaps to amortize RPC costs. Um, in event time, you can have a diagram that looks really similar that has a totally different use. Um, so my elements come in, and then I maybe I immediately output something uh, about the incoming event. And I say, all right, call me back when the watermark hits the end of the window, because I'm gonna do some special finalization work. So perhaps what I did was I output a speculative result, and now I've stored the speculative result. And later, when the timer goes off, I'm gonna pull back all the different speculative results I've output, maybe there's been a few, and I'll just output one final correction uh, in case I have a different output. Otherwise, I'll save the bandwidth downstream. So those are just some like sort of examples of how you'd use it. Um, and these are, we are looked at sort of per key arbitrary numbering, outputting when result changes. Uh, you can use this for sort of tight side input control. If you have your main event stream and you want to enrich it with data that's being updated once in a while, uh, this is a good way to have very explicit control over how that works. Um, in order to do sort of classic stream join algorithms, you really need to have direct access to state. Um, and also it lets you have fine grained control over the low level details of a lot of sort of aggregations. Um, there's a theme which is just Beam has this high level functional programming inspired API that includes a bunch of parallelism automatically and state and timers um, has a really low level API where you can do all kinds of stuff that would be extremely difficult to do with a high level API, um, but parallelism is sort of on you in terms of getting enough keys. Um, and, and at the bottom I want to especially highlight uh, per key workflows is a term that uh, it floats around once in a while, but it means these state machines where you have much more complex state. You have, uh, you really have a sequence of phase transitions and maybe a bunch of timers, like a user signs up at your site and they're in the pending state, and then either they sign up by an appropriate moment in event time or an event time timer says, oh, send them a reminder and things like that. So it really opens up things that are not analytics and they're not ETL. Um, that are, you know, make a ton of sense in stream processing. Um, the temptation, of course, is since this is a very, you know, it's very easy to know that you can accomplish your goal, the temptation is just use this a lot. Um, but there's performance considerations. We have to shuffle in order to get all the keys in one place. Um, and I mentioned plenty of times that the parallelism requires having sufficient keys. But it also, there's some, there's some cost to storing the state and timers, um, and particularly, um, cleaning up the state when a window expires, things like that. So now I have a demo. Um, so what I wanted to do for my demo is prove that this exists and that it runs on a few different runners. You know what? This is Java code, and I'm not going to zoom in so that you can read it. <laughs> okay, I will. I'm not gonna do it because I don't know the hotkey to zoom in. But the thing is, it's a, stream, it's a screen full of code, I declare some state, I declare some timers, it's proof that I have code in my IDE. That's really what I wanted to show because then I'm gonna go to my terminal. I'm just gonna run the code, I'm gonna get it started. The first thing you'll do when you're debugging Beam Pipeline is you'll run it in the direct runner. So the direct runner is a full implementation of the Beam model. It runs in memory on your laptop. Um, this is in Java. Um, and I just copied and pasted the Maven command in there because Maven 
And it's going to start running, and it's just going to start logging sort of the approximate quantile state. So here, this is a, I'm outputting a bunch of numbers and counting how many odd, number, odd digits they have. So we're expecting something like a binomial distribution. Um, and let me zoom in a little bit more. You don't need to be able to interpret lists of numbers as a binomial distribution, but it's sort of converging. You can see that it sort of uh, changes more rapidly on the edges. So while that runs, I will pop over to, let's say, a different window. I also, I spun up a little Flink cluster on my yarn cluster, and I started the same pipeline running on last Thursday, I think it was. So just proof, there is a yarn cluster. It does have a Flink master on it. And I'm on the wrong Wi-Fi network for this room. Well, that loads. I'll pull over the data flow job that's also been running since uh, last night, I think. So create a bunch of fake data, window it actually by hour. Um, and then I do this anonymous or this parallel quantile state computation. Um, and if I pop open this, I actually think you'll see sort of all the same logging um, is actually coming out somewhere down here. But yeah, so this one's set up at like 10,000 events a second. I think I threw more machines at the Flint cluster. I think this is a 10 machine cluster. So this job's running at like 100,000 events a second. But they're just numbers, so it's not a tremendous, not tremendously impressive. But yeah, so now, you know, just prove that I also did, a, this, this state works, it does what it's supposed to do. Um, there haven't been any outputs on my direct runner for the last couple minutes because the state converged. So great, I successfully wrote a program <laughs> that uh, you know does what I claim this can be used to do. And yeah, and it runs. You know, um, right now the state support is most mature in Flink, of course, because Flink has great state support um, and and data flow. Um, and the other runners are Apex, which is sort of inherently stateful as well. Um, and we're working up support there and also in Spark. On, in the streaming version of the Spark Runner. So the quick summary is that state and timers in Beam, it unlocks new use cases. They're use cases that you are probably expecting you could already do if you're a Flink user. Um, but they just work with event time windowing, which is pretty cool, including sort of state management. And they're portable across all these different runners. So you get the typical uh, Beam portability story. Um, and when, you know, if you start to use it in Python, it's this, sort of the same API. It works on all the different runners uh, because it goes over a language independent API there when Python matures. So that's that's my talk. Um, I'm Ken. There's a link to the slides. It's FFSF 2017 Beam State. Um, there's a design doc if you want to read way too much and see our engineering arguing comments. Um, there's a blog post. Uh, mostly to you guys, I would love it if you just join the Beam community if this is interesting to you at all, right? Join the user list or the dev list, depending on what you're into. Um, follow Apache Beam on Twitter. And I really also want to say, if you're Flink enthusiasts, you who can really easily contribute to Beam on Flink. Um, there's new types of state that you can improve the support for in the Flink runner. There's tons of polish that's available. Um, easy launch of a Beam job on Flink on Yarn uh, is something that is getting this demo together was not as straightforward as you might want um, because of that. And we're working right now on a really fun and exciting project of getting integration tests at scale for all of our different Beam backends. So if you are interested in scale, it's another great opportunity. Thanks. Questions? So in the past, we had a choice between using the Flink coding model and or using the runner. And a lot of it is sort of the difference between how the level of functionality you have there versus the level of functionality for the various runners if you ran them natively. That's going to be a constant tension of you. Yeah, I, this is a great question. So it's sort of, I, I, and people have said this term that like, well, Beam, it supports all these different runners. It claims portability. Is it just sort of, 
this lowest common denominator? Does it, is it not featureful relative to them? But what I guess what Beam is, is it's sort of a back to the fundamentals programming model. And so we actually let it run ahead of the runners. And so the runners are actually keeping up with the programming model in a lot of cases. So um, there will always be this tension between portability, which is all the runners can do it, versus having all the features that you need for your use case. Um, and we, we keep a capability matrix on the website. So you go to the Beam site, and you can see whether your runner has the capabilities that you're looking for. Um, I know that's, I just, I turned that into a very broad answer to the problem, the question. Is that? Maybe another way of phrasing it is, how, do I, how does it fail when I use something at the Beam level that the underlying runner that I've moved to doesn't support? So um, that's a. I may, uh, again, answer a related question, which is that how it fails is that we actually build um, this graph, and each runner has awareness of its own capabilities and can analyze the graph to say, oh, I don't actually support that. So that's how it, you know, that's how it fails at the moment of. Um, is that what you're asking? Okay. Well, I'm, I'd love to talk, chat all about this uh, anytime. Okay. Well, thanks. Okay.